Right before we jump into this video, if you'd like me to send you a free guide to capturing motion in low light situations, just look for this orange box over on my website, put your name, email address in it, hit send it, and I will send you that guide for free. Jared Poland, Fronos Photo. Dot com, and this is a comparison between the Canon R6, the Sony a7 IV, and the Nikon Z6 II. Now, I've used all of these cameras in the real world, so I've experienced using them, sample images, know the ins and outs of these systems, especially after using most of the systems for years. What I mean by most of the systems, meaning I've used Canon for a long time, I've used Sony for a long time, I've used Nikon for a long time, so I have a great insight into basically all of their cameras to help you decide which one of these might be the best one for you if you're starting out today or looking to upgrade. Should you jump ship from Nikon to go to one of these? Should you jump ship from Canon to do something? And the something was more pointing here. So in this video, I'm helping you figure that out. So the way that this video works is I go through the specs for each of these cameras and I give check marks. And do those check marks mean anything, Steven? No. Not, not really, but they're just fun to give. So why don't we give you a check mark at home for being here and watching? So now let's start with the sensors inside of each one of these cameras. Starting with the Canon R6, we have a 20.1 megapixel full frame CMOS sensor that's powered by a Digic X processor or Digic 10 processor. Now what's interesting about this is that's the same sensor and processor in the much more expensive flagship 1DX Mark III. That's right, the same sensor and the same processor in this smaller, less expensive body. It's a fantastic sensor. Now it's a little lower at 20.1 megapixels, but you can do a ton with that, and you'll see that in the rest of the specs when we get to those. Now let's move over to the Sony a7 IV. You have a brand new 33 megapixel full frame BSI CMOS sensor powered by a Bion's XR processor, which is the same processor that you find in the flagship Sony A1. Now 33 megapixels is well, pretty good. It's the highest megapixel of these, we'll call them entry-level full-frame cameras. I mean, they're mostly the entry levels, even though Nikon has a Z5 off to the side that's lower than this. We're gonna stick with these. It's basically the stepping stone into full-frame as of today. Well, I might as well also say that Canon has the RP, but that's not nearly as good as this camera right here. Oh, and while I'm at it, uh, Sony has the A7C. I believe we did a video. Did we do a comparison about that, Steven? I have a ton of stuff to say about this camera. I don't, I don't know either. We'll, we'll get back to you if we did a comparison of those. I think we have. But anyway, 33 megapixels is an unbelievable point to be at at this time. 33, it's like if you're shooting weddings, I could see having two of these for shooting weddings and maybe not needing anything more than that. This is a fantastic sensor to start and 33 megapixels is a great place to be. Now moving on to the Z6 II, we have a 24.5 megapixel BSI CMOS sensor that's powered by dual Xpeed 6 processors. So the 24.5 megapixel sensor is a very good sensor as well. I mean, up here, my favorite quality, my favorite image quality of all of them is really the Nikon. I think the Nikon gives you the best image quality. Now, before you jump and go, I'm gonna buy the Nikon, there's a lot more to say because it's about the entire system. The quality you get off of a Nikon sensor is amazing and why I shot Nikon up until two years ago. If I had my druthers, meaning if I could pick what I really wanted, I would put a Nikon sensor inside of a Sony body or a Canon body and I would, I just love the files that you get. The files are great off of the Sony as well, and the files are very good off the Canon. Also, it just becomes a megapixel race. At some point, there's pros and cons to both. More megapixels generally means a larger file, and it may mean lesser ability to shoot at higher ISOs, but nowadays, you can really extend ISOs pretty darn far and still get great results. So check mark, I'm gonna give a check mark to the Nikon for image quality, and that doesn't mean that it's the best of the best with Honor Sir, because you can kind of match it with these two, but let's give a check mark over here, and then let's give a check mark that hovers right here between both of these. Speaking of ISO, let's jump right in there. The Canon goes from 100 natively to 102,400, expandable all the way up to 204,800. The Sony is 100 to 51,200 natively, expandable up to the same 204,800. 
the Nikon gives you 100 to 51,200, expandable up to 204,800, which is basically the same. Now, Canon is telling you that you get one stop better in the native ISO. Now, native means the recommended area because with the Nikon, you'll see like H1 or expanded. And what expanded is, it's like you can do it, but we don't really recommend it, but you can do it if you really, really want. And so as you push to the higher ISOs beyond, those are just, they're not recommended. You can do it, not recommended. They, they're Honestly, they're all fantastic across the board. I've pushed the Z6, which is the one prior to this, to 10,000 ISO when shooting uh, a low light situation at a wedding. It was fantastic. You can push it far. This, you could do the exact same thing. You're pushing 8,000, 10,000 ISO. You're gonna get great results. The Canon, absolutely gonna do the same thing. Great results pushing ISOs. Look, I don't go much beyond 10,000 or maybe 12,800 at the very most, but keep in mind, just because you can push it super far, it doesn't mean that it's going to turn out well. What I mean by that is if you have a low light situation where there really isn't any light, it doesn't matter how far you push the ISO, it's still gonna look like garbage without light because photography is all about light. Or if you have a bright situation and you shoot at 8,000 ISO, it's still gonna look super duper clean compared to shooting in a low light situation at 8,000 ISO. You're gonna see some differences. These cameras across the board all get check marks because because they all are great with the ISO capabilities today. Now, this is where we're gonna get some separation. We're gonna lift and we're gonna separate just a little bit here. Actually, I'm not even gonna move anything. But with the R6, you can get 12 frames per second mechanical, 20 frames per second with the electronic shutter. Now, when you do go into the electronic shutter, you are getting a 12-bit raw file instead of 14-bit. What that means is there's less data because if you're shooting at 20 frames per second with the electronic shutter, you're pushing a lot of data through there, so they give you a smaller bit file, 14 versus 12. With the a7 IV, you're getting 10 frames a second with the electronic, but you're also getting 10 frames a second with the mechanical. So there's not 20 frames a second with the electronic shutter, it's 10 and 10. Now, there's a caveat here that I discovered with the a7 IV. If you just shoot it in high plus or the higher frame rates, you're gonna get six frames per second. Now, six frames per second is when you're shooting in the uncompressed RAW. That's how you get the 14-bit best RAW file out of this camera, you get six frames a second. That is kinda slow in this day and age, especially when you're getting 12 frames per second here with the, with the Canon, and you can get up to 14 with a caveat with the Nikon, six frames is pretty slow. Now, you don't always need to motor drive, but it is slow when it comes to sports and a lot of action going on. And if you want the best file, you shoot 14-bit uncompressed. Now, I discovered when I went into compressed RAW, I was able to get the 10 frames a second. 10 frames a second mechanical, 10 frames a second with the silent, but that is a compressed RAW file. You're getting 12 bits instead of 14. So that is the trade-off there. That's one thing you have to know. Uh, the way that I discovered this is I thought that when I put it into H+, that I would end up, that, that the camera would automatically know to dumb it down to give me the 10 frames a second, which it doesn't. It didn't know that. The Canon automatically does it. The Nikon automatically does it. I don't know why the Sony doesn't do it. But 10 and 10 is still a good amount to get, but 6 and 6 with the uncompressed is mostly where I'll I'll end up shooting unless I'm doing action sports. Now on the Nikon front, I did say you can get up to 14 frames per second. The problem with that, that's if you're in single point AF. That's not really where you wanna be. It's not really usable and there's really no reason to do that. But you do get nine frames a second with 14 bit raw and that is a nice place to be. And you will get more frames per second if you go into the 12 bit mode as well. So across the board, you can see we're shooting at places that we never would have thought of just you know 10 to 12 years ago. It's just insane what you are capable of doing. The fact that you can do 20 frames per second with an electronic shutter in this camera is insane. Now what you do need to keep in mind is that when you shoot with the electronic shutters, you may get what's called rolling shutter. That's where you get kind of a jelloing effect in your photos, where if you swung a golf club, you might see that it bends, or if a baseball player was swinging a bat, you might see that it, it you get slightly bent there. That's because of the readout speeds 
of the sensors. Now it's gonna vary across the board here. I did notice, notice a lot of wobbling with the Sony when I was panning to shoot the hockey players. The background just skewed and looked like this. Now they'll all give you a little bit of that. If you're shooting portraits silently or if you're shooting a wedding, obviously if there's a lot of movement, you may see some issues but it's very nominal. Just know it's those super high speed action moments where you might see some imperfections. Now the most people, the everyday people, they'll never notice it, but you may notice it. So which one gets the cake here? I, I'm, Steven, do you agree? Do you, do you agree the Canon? Yeah. I, I agree that I, I think the Canon does. The 10 frame, the, the 12 frames a second straight off the bat, impressive. And the 20 frames per second electronic is really impressive as, as well. So let's go with 20 check marks right here for the Canon. Let me jump in here real quick because I want to show you Fropac 3 in action on this photo taken with the A7 IV, starting with fifth element. Fifth Element looks great just with one click. Then you've got Capone, gives it a very interesting look. Then we have King Contrast. King Contrast looks nice and boomy. Mentos pulls back just a little bit. Then we've got November Rain, no vignette. That gives it a nice look. And then we have Prestige Worldwide, which also looks good. But I wanna go up to Fro Pack 2 because check this out. Matte Black High Contrast looks pretty cool. And then we've got Double Stuffed Oreos with no vignette. So if you're looking to speed up your raw workflow or give yourself a great starting point, we created 15 custom Lightroom presets that you can check out right now at fronosphoto.com slash Fro Pack 3. While you're over there, you can play with the sliders to see the befores and the afters. And if you decide to pick them up right now, they are on sale. Or if you want to get Fro Pack 1, 2, and 3 as the Fro Pack bundle, you can save even more. Now, let's get back to the video. Now let's move on to the lens mount, starting with the Canon. You have an RF mount. The RF mount is fantastic. The lenses that Canon has put out so far for the RF lineup are great. Now they tend to be a little more expensive, like a 28 to 70 F2 clocks in at around $3,000, but you do have a 15 to 35 2.8, a 14 to 35 F4. You've got the 70 to 200, the 24 to 70 2.8, an 85 one two, a 50 one two, a 100 macro, 28. You've got a lot of great options. You also have some lesser expensive options as well now, but you also have the ability to adapt EF lenses. There's like 50 million plus EF lenses that Canon has produced over the years, and you can adapt that with up. They, they have three different adapters. The cheapest one is 99 bucks, but that allows you to adapt. EF glass and basically seamlessly use it on this body. The only issue is you have to remember that you have an adapter on it and if you switch to RF lenses then you just have to get used to taking the adapter off, but it is a great option. Especially if you already have Canon EF glass, you have no problem putting it on here. Or if you have third party Sigma or Tamron, you can adapt that as well. Now there is no native support yet for Sigma or Tamron or third party lenses, meaning those companies are are not making RF mount glass yet for the Canon bodies. So the fact that you have all that EF glass that you can adapt is still pretty good. And I'm thinking down the road, you will start to see third party support for the RF mount. Moving on to Sony, we have what's called the E mount. Now there is a very good selection of native lenses for the E mount currently. There's, there's quite a bit. The, what is it, 65, Stephen, as of now? Yeah. Yeah, 65. E mount lenses, some are good, some are not very good, some are more expensive, some are less expensive, but what you do have is third party support from Tamron and Sigma. They make native lenses for the E mount, so you do not need an adapter. They're fantastic. There's a lot of great affordable Tamron glass, which brings the price down for entry. Whereas if you wanted to get a native RF lens here, you're gonna be spending a lot more money right off the bat for that glass versus buying a Tamron or a Sigma to get you started with this camera. So third party support is already here, but you also don't have a lot of backlog of older E-mount lenses that you can purchase like what you had with EF. You've got years and years and many years of that on the EF side and the E-mount hasn't been around as long just yet. Now finally with the Nikon you have what's called the Z-mount or Zoltan or 
Z Zed if you're those people that don't say Z and you just like saying Zed. You've got the Z mount, which is a massive mount. It has a really big hole for putting lenses on it. Now, Nikon does not have a ton of native glass just yet. I think we're in like the low 20s if I am correct. There's some really good, you got the 14 to 24 2.8, the 24 to 72.8, 70 to 200 2.8, there's a 51.8, there's a 51.2, but those 1.8 lenses that they have are very good. They're a little more pricey than the older 1.8 lenses that they had, but you have a nice selection right now for the native glass if you were to start with this. But you also have a nice selection of F-mount glass, something like 90 different older F-mount lenses you can adapt with the F to Z adapter to this body that allow you to use Use the older lenses up to there's 90 different ones that still would work here and that's good too because you can buy those pretty inexpensively I will say I do think that the Canon EF lenses adapt better with the with the RF mount than with the the Nikon Nikon struggles a little with the autofocus normally and I think it's gonna struggle a little more with sharpness edge to edge when you're adapting look I had a 35 1 4 one of the greatest lenses that Nikon made I loved that I loved it before I sold it um, that lens was great I noticed that the 35-1.8 just felt better on this body. Now that's a testament to what Nikon has done with the Z mount and their Z lenses. They're fantastic. I still would prefer a 35-1.4 or 1.2 one day, but I ended up realizing that that 35-1.4 just wasn't as accurate. It wasn't as sharp when I adapted it here. Now that's my that's my real world experience. Other people may say something else, but that's my real world experience. And that's why I'm sharing that with you. Now, is there third party lens support here? No, not yet at all. So that hopefully will come one day. Um, but as of right now, I think, oh, this is tough. This is tough. This is a tough one. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna point to both of these right now because because Sony has a lot of great lenses, but that third-party lens support, especially for an entry-level, basically entry-level full-frame camera, you can't go wrong with the Sigma and Tamron glass here to save some of that money. I rather see you buy uh, two Sigma or Tamron lenses to give you a nice starting point as 2.8 lenses versus one super expensive one lens from the E-mount to get you started here. Uh, and there's a, a lot of great options, like I said, for RF already and with the older EF glass. So check marks are going over these two right here. Moving on to autofocus, which is one of the most important things and one of the big benefits, major benefits of a mirrorless camera is you have a lot more autofocusing points. The Canon right here has 1,053 phase detection autofocusing points that go edge to edge. You have 100% coverage. That means the focusing points touch the top, the bottom, the left, the right, the BA, the BA, the select and the start, and you get 30 men in Contra. Sorry, 30 people in Contra for today. Though I don't think there was a woman fighter, but if it was brought back today, you could have a woman fighter with 30 lives. Now Canon uses what's called dual pixel AF. That is an incredible system that they've created. It goes back to the 70D, which was a DSLR where you had dual pixel AF, which was unbelievable. It's only gotten better and better. And with that dual pixel AF, you also have face detect as well as eye tracking. So you can track a subject's eye or an animal's eye and the camera just follows it and changes the autofocus for you seamlessly because it works really well with the RF glass. It just, the autofocusing system is bonkers. It's absolutely insane. When I shot football with this thing, it just, the subject could be moving left and right and side and back and up and back and doing whatever they need to do. They could roll, a person could come in front of them and bam, you are nailing focus time and time again. I trust the focus so much in these systems that I feel like I can just rely on it. I feel like I'm getting images that I otherwise would have missed if I was trying to control the focusing points myself. So I let the camera do the dirty work now because that's why we have this technology. Let the camera do what it's going to do and you're gonna get fantastic results because this autofocusing system is incredible. With the Sony, you have 759 point fit phase detection AF points that go edge to edge basically with 94% coverage. So it doesn't do the same 100% coverage as the Canon, but 94% is still really good. You have the lock-on tracking, you have the IAF, you have the animal AF, you have a lot of features in here and Sony is really the company that 
that revolutionized this for the last couple of generations of cameras. You had it with the a7 III, but you had to actually activate it by holding down a button. Now it's full-time lock-on tracking and IAF. It's one of the reasons I switched to Sony when I went from Nikon to Sony because Canon didn't have anything out yet, and the Sony just did what I needed it to do. Talk about a revolution. The first time I ever encountered it, I was at a Philadelphia Union game photographing the announcer up in the press booth, and I was like, oh my God, I had no idea that this was so easy to use. I mean, that was a revelation in my brain and really set me on my path to dumping all my Nikon gear to go with the Sony A9 uh, and, and the A7R4 at the time. It was just absolutely incredible what it could do. And now that technology is all in here and it's gotten better. So it is absolutely fantastic what you can do with this autofocus. Last but not least, or shall I say, um, last, uh, the, the Nikon autofocus. We've got 273 point phase detection AF points. You do have IAF, you do have subject tracking, you do have animal AF. Now, you do have it, that doesn't mean that it's going to be perfect. I'll just say it straight out. It, it does not even come close to matching what the Canon and what the Sony do. It just doesn't. After their upgrade from the, the Z6 to the Z6 II, it was nominal, it was small, it does it. It can do IAF, it can do animal AF, it's just on a slower pace. You have less focusing points, you don't seem to have as much power with the processing engines to move those points around, and the focus just seems slower. Super accurate though, when you do get your stuff in focus, uh, with the Nikon. Now, I've, I've worked with this extensively, and it upsets the Nikon shooters who have never used these other systems when I say that the autofocus in here isn't great. I say that because I've used every single system. It's like night and next week when you use these versus using this. You can use it, but I feel like I'm missing shots that I shouldn't be missing that I otherwise would have gotten and captured with these cameras. Now that's just the autofocus side of it. I will still come back and say that the quality of that sensor is fantastic. When it comes to the landscapes and the not fast moving things, it's going to be very good. But when it comes to the autofocusing system, this is a super tough one to give a check mark to. But instead of giving check marks to these two, we're going to take a check mark away from the Nikon for their not great autofocusing system. Let me jump in here real quick and say that this video is brought to you by Squarespace. If you're looking to build your very own online portfolio, use what I use for jaredpolen.com, which is my personal portfolio. I use it because it's easy, it's simple, I don't need to know coding, and it is super affordable. So if you'd like to get a 14-day free trial, head on over to squarespace.com slash photo. If you decide that it's for you, use the code photo at checkout to get 10% off your first order. Now, since we already talked about how many frames a second you can shoot, let's talk about the buffer that you get inside of these cameras. Not Michael Buffer and not his brother. Uh, what's his brother's name? I forgot what his brother's name is, but his brother was like, uh, let's go, wait, one was let's get ready to rumble. And then the other one was it's showtime, but he doesn't sound as good as his brother. What can I tell you? Hope I don't, hope I don't get sued for that one. Uh, buffers, you got 240 raw files that you can squeeze out on the Canon. 828 raw files when using CF Express Type A cards, which we'll talk about those card slots in just a second. 828, that's quite a lot that you get there. With the Nikon, you get 124 raw files, which really isn't bad. You shouldn't outrun it. Now that's in the high extended mode, um, and in normal high mode, the buffer will never fill. Oh, and also if you're shooting JPEGs, you're probably never gonna outrun these buffers anyway. And if you do hold your finger down as a, as a roll of thumb, and by thumb, I mean finger. If you're shooting and holding the button down for like five, six seconds and outrunning the camera, you may want to take a step back and realize that, well, you have to edit all those images and you just overshot. So just because you can shoot a lot of frames per second doesn't mean that you should. Quick bursts, quick bursts. Take advantage of those 12 or 20 frames. It's like, boom, you got that quick burst and then you move on. So who gets the check mark here? Well, Sony is getting the check mark here. They're not getting 800 of them. They'll just get one 
at this point. Since we just talked about buffer, let's get to card slots. The Canon R6 has two UHS-2 SD slots, and they can write both photos and videos to those uh, redundantly when you're shooting. That was a new firmware update that they put out, which is great. So what that means is when you shoot photos and you have two cards in the camera and you shoot RAW, you will get RAW files to both. It's redundant. If you shoot video, it's redundant. You're gonna get the same file to both just in case you ever have an issue with one card blowing up. Now, that's happened to me in the past in one of my Sony. It was an A9 II, I believe. But luckily, because I had it redundant, I was able to save all of my photos at the time. And that was incredible to be able to do. Not happy that a card failed, but the fact that I was shooting redundant is great. Cards are inexpensive compared to what would happen if you lose a job. If you lose a job, you lose reputation, you gotta give your money back, and you just probably will never get hired again from those people. So I always shoot redundant, raw to both slots, at all times. I don't wanna have any issues. So SD card slots, not bad, it's a UHS-2, uh, they're super fast. But speaking of super fast, with the Sony, you have one CF Express Type A slot as well as one UHS-2 SD card slot. Now you can write photos to both as well as videos to both. Now my major question here for Sony was, why didn't you just put two of those in there? Now if I had to guess, or two of the CF Express Type A slots, the reason being is money. There's no other explanation that could possibly be given other than to save money. Because listen to this, the CF Express Type A slot that's in here is reverse compatible. It takes a CF Express A card, and if you take that out, you could put in an SD card. And the other slot just takes an SD card. So why wouldn't you just put two of the same if it just wasn't money? Now, being that it's more of the entry level full frame, I could see that people would just have a lot of SD cards around or would buy new fast SD cards to put in here and have the, the same card slot because these CF Express Type A cards are much more expensive, but they are great. They are super fast. They cut down on the speed, uh, the transfer speed to your computer, and they do write fast. Thus why you get those 828 RAW files in that buffer. So that's awesome. On the Nikon front, you have one CF Express Type B slot which is super fast. That's like a lightning fast card. It's great, it's bigger, but you also have one UHS-2 SD card slot. Uh, you can write photos to both, but you can't write video to both of these slots. Now, the CF Express Type B cards are also expensive. As much as I love those, I would rather have seen them put two CF Express Type B cards in here, or at the very least, two SD cards, we could get away with it. There's no reason why at this point you couldn't. Or you should just get it right, which is what Sony does at this point, and put two uh, CF Express Type A slots in there that are reverse compatible. So I'm gonna go ahead and give a check mark. Oh geez, I almost gave it to Sony, but I, I'm, I'm still gonna go with the, with the Sony because the technology for doing the, the two, the fact that you can do the CF Express Type A if you want, or the SD with dual slots if you want is better than what the other two give you. Even though two SD cards are pretty good here, I just like the fact that I have the option to do that in this camera. So check mark right here. Moving on to the viewfinders. You have what's called an electronic viewfinder or EVF, electronic viewfinder, that's what we call them. The old school way was called an optical viewfinder or an OVF. We have a link down in the description that will give you the examples or explain to you in more detail what the differences are. Back in the old days, people would say they hated the EVF because it just looked like a bad TV screen or it flickered or it hurt their eyes. That doesn't exist anymore. These EVFs are absolutely perfect. Starting with the Canon, you have a 3.69 million dot EVF with 120 frames per second refresh rate. The Sony, you have a 3.68 million dot EVF with 120 frames per second refresh rate. And with the Nikon, you have a 3.69 million dot EVF with a 60 frames per second refresh rate. Now, you might see a slight difference when shooting sports with the slower refresh rate of 60 frames per second. But honestly, I haven't had an issue when using this shooting action or shooting sports. I didn't really notice much of a difference. These EVFs across the board are all good. I'm not gonna sit here and give any of them a check mark, but ev you know what? You know who gets a check mark, Steven? Who? who? EVFs get a check mark. Flat out, EVFs are incredible. Now let's move on to the screens. The Canon has a three inch 1.6 two million dot very angled touch screen where you can touch everything. What I mean by touch everything is you can touch all of the menus and make changes and all that. That's a good thing because some of the cameras, um, like the older versions of the Sony, wouldn't allow you to touch the menu. They were like, 
Every time you touch the menu, you know what happened, Stephen? What? It went, ban in it, it, ban in it, it, can't touch it, dude. That's right. That's what it did. You can't, you can't touch me either, because that's we're at work. We're at work, so you can't do that. The Sony has a three inch, 1.03 million dot vari angle touch screen where you can touch everything. It's pretty much one of the first Sonys that allows you to flip the screen out and rotate it. They still use a lower resolution screen compared to everybody else. I prefer looking through an EVF at all times when I'm reviewing images. It just looks cleaner and sharper and better. And with the Nikon, you have a 3.2 inch 2.1 million dot tilting touch screen where you can touch everything. Now this one does not flip out and rotate. I think the Nikon has the best screen of all of these cameras, which is probably funny because if I had to guess, and I don't know this for sure, Sony probably makes the panel that's in here, but it is fantastic, the screen that you have on here, but it doesn't flip out and rotate. So for the people that want to flip out and rotatable screen, the Nikon doesn't give it to you. Um, nobody gets a check mark again, because they all have the flip out screens. They're all very similar across the board, but that's going to be it for that section. Moving on to the video video specs. These are what's called hybrid camera. I mean, every camera is a hybrid damn camera these days, meaning it shoots photos, it shoots video. It can do everything. It's a master of many things and they do them well. So let's get to the specs of the Canon R6. You have full frame 4K UHD video recording at up to 60 frames per second at 10 bit 422. The 4K is oversampled from 5.1K with no pixel binning. You can get full frame 120 frames per second at 1080p. You have a 2959 record limit. Uh, it is possible to overheat it if you shoot too long or in, if you're in a super hot area. You do have C-Log 1 and 3 if you want to get more control over your image. You do have a micro HDMI port on the side. We prefer when you have a full-size HDMI port on the side. Now we are using the Canon R5 to shoot this video with both of these cameras right now. And when we need extra cameras in the studio, we do break out the R6 because it, it is fully capable. The downsampling is incredible. You get a very nice file out of this camera. It is a well-rounded camera and you can get some great results with video. You do get that limit of 2959, which a lot of cameras have started to remove, but really, 30 minutes straight shooting is pretty darn good. Moving on to the Sony, you can shoot full frame 4K UHD at 30 frames per second, 10 bit 422. The 4K is oversampled from 7K with no pixel binning. You have Super 35 4K up to 60 frames per second. Full frame, you can get 120 frames per second at 1080p. You have unlimited record time, so not 2959. There is no overheating. It's gonna be hard to overheat this bad boy unless you throw it in the oven. You've got S-Log3 and S-Cinetone. You do have that full HDMI port that we do love. They have a new mode called Focus Breathing Compensation. You have a digital hot shoe on top and you have plug and play streaming, which is pretty good if you are a cam girl or cam guy or cam other. This is a great camera when it comes to shooting video. You get some great results here. Sony has done a great job with not dumbing down the quality of footage that you get in their lesser priced bodies. So good job from Sony on making this body. Lots of great features inside of it for video. Now let's get to Nikon. You have full frame 4K UHD video recording at 30 frames per second, 8-bit 420. You can do 4K oversampled from 6K without pixel binning. There's full frame 120 frames per second at 1080p. You also have 4K at up to 60 frames per second. There's 10-bit 422 with N-Log to an external recorder with a slight crop. You've got a time limit of 2959. There is no overheating that we've ever run into with the Z6 II, and it does have a mini HDMI port. Now, we used the Z6 and the Z6 II in the studio for a while for video, and there was some nice quality. You got nice quality with it, but the autofocus was still going to be better on the Canon front as well as the Sony front. So we made the switch in the studio to Canon about a year ago, and we're very happy with the results that we get with our R5s and R6s. So in terms of video, this is where it gets slightly interesting because in this particular setup, which would be the check mark winner when it comes to video? I think by a slight margin, the Sony may be a better option right now. The Nikon, it's fine. It wouldn't be my first choice. If you're a hybrid shooter, you can't go wrong with the Canon. You can't go wrong with the Sony, but the Sony gets a slight edge in the video front on this one. So let's give a check mark 
to Sony. Unless you want full frame 4K 60, if that's what you're looking for, then the Canon gives you that. The Sony does that with a slight little crop. With the Nikon, just like the Sony, you can get 4K 60p in Super 35. Let me jump in here and say, if you're looking to purchase any of these cameras new, or you're looking to buy some used gear, or honestly, any camera gear for that matter, just look for the link down below to Alan's camera. That's my affiliate link that helps me to continue to make these videos, but it also helps you to support a mom and pop store that's been around for a while and competes against all of the major camera stores. Now moving on to image stabilization. The Canon gives you five axis in-body stabilization, but up to eight stops with certain lenses. When you pair it with RF lenses on this, you're getting up to eight stops of image stabilization. Now you'll get seven stops with most lenses. The IBIS in this body, is fantastic. You can hand hold at super slow shutter speeds when you pair the RF lenses with this. You can still get slow shutter speeds when you use the EF lenses adapted to this. Just understand that just because you can hand hold at slower shutter speeds doesn't mean that you're gonna end up getting a sharp image if a subject is moving fast. Keep that in mind that it can counteract your movement. It can't freeze something that's in front of you at a slower shutter speed. With the Sony, you have five axis steady shot, up to five and a half stops of stabilization. This seems to be something they haven't really upgraded in quite some time, but they do have an option that gives you something slightly better than the Canon, but there is cropping involved. It's called optical active mode stabilization. It's when you use Sony software, it's gonna really crop in a little more, but it's gonna be super smooth when it does it, but I prefer it doing it without the cropping. And with the Nikon, you've got five axis in body VR up to five stops of stabilization. It's very good here. They're all very good across the board, but the check mark absolutely has to go to Canon on this one because when you pair it with those RF lenses, it is unstoppable. Moving on to battery, let's talk about the Canon battery. You've got the LPE6NH with the ability to do USB charging. You can get a grip with this. It's gonna cost you more money, but it's a vertical grip. I prefer using that. If you like to shoot vertical, it's much more comfortable. It allows you to put an extra battery in there. Battery life of these cameras are all fantastic at these points, but just don't have one battery. Have at least two batteries and get one of those external USB chargers at this point. I mean, we plug right into the camera to keep it charging all the time when we're using it with a USB-C power brick. Yeah, we, we bought the Anchor one for like $37 on Amazon because it's much cheaper than the $169 version that I think that Canon's AC power adapter is, and it's been great for us. So yeah, that's what we use. Moving on to the Sony, you have what's called the, the we call it the Z battery because it says Z right on the pack. This is one of the best mirrorless batteries that you will find across the board in the smaller battery size. It has the best SEPA rating. We've also found that it, it, they just last a long amount of time. Now you can get a grip for this body as well. The cool thing about Sony's grips is that they will work across the board on their latest generation bodies. So the A7R4 uses the same grip, the A1 uses the same grip, the A7S3 probably uses the same grip, and I believe that the A92 uses, uses the same grip as well. So that's cool if you have more. I find myself that if I'm testing out a body, I'll just take the grip off of one and put it onto the other and carry on my wayward son. Now moving on to Nikon, we've got the ENEL15C battery. It has USB charging and there is a grip available. Not much else to say. It works. It gets the job done. I do recommend getting a grip with all of these things. So who wins here? Well, we're gonna say that Sony wins when it comes to the battery. So it's gonna get a Z-shaped check mark because the Z battery is fantastic. Now, like I said, you can go across the board with this grip. You can do the same thing with the, the Canon. You can put the same grip on the, the what's this thing called? R6. The, the R6. You can put the same thing on the R6 as you can do with the R5. So one grip to rule them all. You could do that with the Nikon. The Z6 II and the Z7 II get the same exact grip. So nobody is getting check marks for their grip. We're almost done. A couple more things to talk about, but let's talk about weight. The Canon weighs in at 1.5 pounds or 680 grams. The Sony weighs in at 1.6 pounds, 737 grams. And the Nikon weighs in at 1.4 pounds and 600 or 615 grams. So I'm giving Nikon a check mark because they earned it for being more svelte in this one. 
They're all light. They're all built very well at this point. I wouldn't drop them. I'd never drop any of these things because, you know, honestly, you could drop one from 10 feet and it works perfectly and you can just knock one over and it stops working. You never know. But in terms of weight, they're all built pretty well. They're all pretty light at this point and you can see that. Now, let's talk about price. We've got the Canon coming in at $24.99. We've got the Sony coming in at $24.99. The Nikon comes in at $19.96.95. That is, well, it's like a lot of money less than the other two. <laughs> you know, when, when Sony came out with the a7 III a couple years ago, that thing came out at under $2,000, $19.99. Actually, it came out at $2,000. I think they called it just $2,000, if I recall their press. It was $2,000, and that was like, wow, they mean business. Do I hate that it's more expensive right now? A little bit. Yes, I mean, money's tight for a lot of people, but if you're gonna make money with this stuff, or even if you're not gonna make money for this stuff, prices go up after three years. Uh, you know what's going on in the world, so a lot has changed. There's inflation, there's extra, there's just supply chain issues, and so prices do go up. The Nikon here at 1996 is, is a really great option to get into a full frame game. It's not bad at all. Um, I, I do like the technologies that you have in the other two slightly better. They would be my choices if I was going to decide on which to, to purchase, which is kind of a good time to sit here and talk about which one might be the right one for you. So I don't know how many check marks there were. They don't determine which one actually wins because it's all about the all encompassing technologies that are in these cameras. The Nikon, Quality wise is very good as I've continued to say. It's their autofocus that is lacking. Their video is fine, their stills are fine. It's fine, it's a, it's a camera that feels great in the hands. They did a great job with their, well, I'd like to say they did a great job with their second camera. It's basically the first camera. This is like an S version of the Z6. It's a slight upgrade that really didn't change very much. It's, it's good. I do expect that they're going to replace this at some point because it's a little over a year old at the time that we're making this. And like I said, it, it's very similar to the original one that, ma that was made. Now, the Sony is fantastic. This is a great hybrid all around camera. If you're looking to get into wedding photography and you wanna save some money and get third party lenses that are all native without having to use an adapter, you can't go wrong with this. If you need a backup to your A9 or your A7R4 or any of your Sony cameras, even the A1, you can't go wrong with a body like this. You just might be shooting slightly slower if you wanna shoot uncompressed, but this would be a fantastic all around photography camera and video. You can shoot wedding videos, you can shoot wedding photos, you can shoot sports, you can shoot portraits. You can do that with all of these. This is a great body. Now the R6 is a great body from Canon. You've got that 1DX Mark III sensor and processor, which allows you to push out those 12 frames a second with mechanical and 20 frames per second in silent. It is a beast of a camera. You could do sports and portraits and weddings and videos and everything that you could do with the Sony, you can do with this as well. Great autofocus, very good video, Great photos, just less megapixels. If megapixels matter to you, obviously you're gonna go with more megapixels. I don't think more megapixels really matter that much at this point unless you're going to be cropping. I think that this decision comes down to these two cameras. The Nikon is probably not where I'm starting unless you already have Nikon gear and you really wanna stay in the Nikon ecosystem and you do a lot more landscapes. You can shoot weddings with it. I know people that shoot weddings with it. You can get great results with anything. I just feel for me personally, if I was choosing, I would not start with this. If you're in the Canon world, you already have a lot of EF glass or Tamron glass and, and, and Sigma glass, you're gonna stick with this system. You're not jumping ship because it's fantastic. Uh, so I really like the offerings that you have here. It's between these two. If you're starting out today, you have to make that decision. Do I wanna be a Canon shooter because I like their ecosystem and I like what they have here? Or do I wanna be a Sony shooter? You have to decide upfront which way you wanna go. So I'm gonna leave that one to you to decide. So what I would like to see you do guys is if you got this far, tell me, I got this far in the comments. Hashtag I got this far. Then let me know which system you would go with if you were starting out today. So thank you very much for watching. Jared Polinfronosphoto.com. See ya.